All right, good morning, everybody. This is Wednesday morning's edition of Ask the Master Auto Technician, and we talk about uh, cars, something you can use on a car. How many people out here own Ford vehicles? Raise your hand if you do. I own Fords out there. How many people you know if your car has spark plug wires or coils over each spark plug? That's where we get a difference of opinion right here, because a lot of people don't know if you have spark plug wires or do they have coils for each individual spark plug. The thing is, they pretty much work, I'm sure, they work the same way as far as getting spark down inside there. But with spark plug wires, normally if you have a V8 engine, you have a coil that fires two wires at the same time. So you only have four coils for a V8 engine, you have three coils for a V6 engine, you have two coils for a four-cylinder engine. That's what we call waste spark, where you have spark on the intake, on the compression stroke where you need it, and then you have spark also on the waste on the exhaust stroke, which you don't need. It's just there. It keeps from having more parts than a car needs. That spark doesn't hurt anything when it lights off in there. It's not a big deal. So, but the next time it comes up around, it hits on that cylinder where it's the intake or on the compression side of it where you got fuel and it lights it off. Well, that is it, it's that's the older type electronic system, ignition system that we had starting back in the 80s, late 80s and 90s and by the time we got to the end of 1990s, we were to where was coil over plug, COP. Just about every car out there that, that I'm talking to, I shouldn't say every car, but the majority of cars out there have a coil over each spark plug. And people say, well, what's the purpose of that? Well, the purpose of that is to make sure it fires a really hot spark that needs that cylinder. Some cars require as many as three uh, pulses of the coil to make sure that they have complete uh, excuse me, complete combustion of the fuel that's in the combustion chamber, especially because it's such a uh, very swirling combustion chamber. That's what I'm trying to say. The swirling combustion chamber of the three valve Ford engine, five point, am I saying this right? 5.4 has a really, uh, from 2004, 2008. Those are perfect examples of spark plugs that don't like to come out of a car, that like to break off in a vehicle because, if they're, especially if they're original equipment type plug, but they have a tendency to, the reason they, the cars misfire so much, and people end up having problems with them is lack of maintenance and understanding the importance of good coils. Ford coils are going to fire about three times in one on, on the suck, squeeze, bang, blow of a four cycle engine. There's so much turbulence inside the combustion chamber that it blows the spark out, so they've designed it where it will actually fire more than once. I know that sounds hard to believe, but that's the way it works. Um, and it does a pretty darn good job. That's why they've done that. They wanted to make sure they, they stopped the problem with catalytic converters getting too much raw gas down them. They wanted to make sure they, 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 the converters lasted longer that way. And they also wanted to make sure that the car got better fuel mileage. That's what they were trying to do with this strange looking three valve system with a funky looking spark plug that no one's ever seen till 2004 came out. Then they looked at it and go, what kind of spark plug is that? Well, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. It's about the electrodes about an inch and a half down inside the combustion chamber. So just to give you an idea, if you have a Ford vehicle and you wonder why you have spark plug wires and why you have spark plug coil of, coils over spark plugs, that's the reason. The ones that have the spark plug coil over plug are much more efficient and give enough power to keep that from happening. I got Wayne calling and he's got a diesel question. Wayne, what's your diesel question this morning? Uh, I was wondering if the uh talk to Mark about more about diesel, mm -hmm. uh, more about fluids, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, more maintenance on, on diesels. What, what question do you... talk a lot about cars. I was going to okay, start okay, what... talking a little bit about diesel. Well, tell me, what kind of diesel do you have? Well, i got two. i got a 3500 uh, Dodge and um, yeah, Cummings and a, mm -hmm. and a John Deere tractor, and they're both pretty close. Same, so. Well, they're, they're well, they're well, they're diesels. That's about the only thing that's yeah, they're diesel, right. <laughs> that's about the only thing that's the same on. Uh, as far as the way now, what year Cummins do you have? Is it the newer one that has uh, diesel exhaust fluid being added to it, or is it an older one? It's the new one, eighteen. It's an eighteen. So you have DEF, diesel exhaust fluid, or what some people call muffler juice. And I'm sure right. I'm sure that was an experience when you when that got low. Did have you had it get low on you where it cut back your power yet? Uh, no. 
Okay. Well, good. That's what. That's one of the things we're, we're talking about: maintenance and fluids on diesels. The DEF fluid, if you let it get too low where it runs out, it will actually put the light on your dash and it'll say reduce power. And if you ignore it long enough, you can bear it'll just idle. It won't go anywhere. That's one of the things I want to let people know about on the diesel exhaust fluid. Make sure you keep that up. The second thing is on, on maintenance, a lot of people think maybe you're that they can go longer between oil changes. I don't know if you think that or not, but a lot of people that own diesels, I say, well, you know, I go longer between oil changes. I said, how long do you go? And he said, I go about nine, 10,000 miles or about once a year. And I go, it, how, how much do you drive a year? And he said, well, I drive about 12,000 miles a year. So they change their oil once a year. And he said, yeah. And I said, don't do that. You really need to change your oil more often. You shouldn't go more than five to 6,000 miles between oil changes, even on a diesel. And I don't know if you do that or not, sir, but Mark says the reason you should do that is because there's so much carbon floating around inside your, your oil. Your oil doesn't get low as it gets older. On diesel engines, your oil actually gets higher. I don't know if you've experienced that or not. And that's from carbon deposits and excess fuel that have gone into the crankcase that uh, actually uh, compromises the oil. So if you wait too long, like you say you wait a year to do an oil change, you could have actually a quart too much the fluid will actually be higher on the stick than normal and you can actually have too much fluid in there due to the fact it's contaminated with carbon and contaminated with extra fuel. Uh, so that's something. What about oil? How often do you change your oil? Well, since then I watched your show, I've changed my oil twice a year. Perfect. And I watch, I use synthetic oils only. Good. And um, I um, even change my transmission fluids, all those fluids since I'm watching your show. Good, good, good. How about but, your uh, one other thing um, on the... Uh, I was wondering about, uh, I have a 71 Monte Carlo. Yeah. Uh, what kind of gas would I put in that since it's hard to find the regular gas? Well, it's a 71, with, yeah, 71 Monte Carlo, the biggest, you can run ethanol fuel in it. Here's the problem. That ethanol fuel, if you leave it in the car for a period of time, it will eat the carburetor gaskets out. That's one thing. It will clog up your jets because that paper in your carburetor gaskets gets dissolved. You know how alcohol does the paper. It dissolves it and right. it, it will dissolve it and any of the nasties that are in your fuel tank for, since 1971, which I'm sure there is, it will dissolve those two and put those in suspension and end up clogging your fuel filter up. You know, it'll do that. And like I said, it can actually end up putting deposits in the bottom of your carburetor float bowl. So it's not recommended to use the newer got the model gas and to, the older cars, but you can buy lots of ethanol free fuel all around this part of the country. I don't know if you live in Bay County or not, but ethanol free fuel would be what I would recommend. Bonifay. Bonifay. I, I'm sure Bonifay, you've got ethanol free gas up there at 87 regular is all you need. And uh, that's, you don't need it because that's that 71 Monte Carlo was just, it was a, it wasn't a high performance engine, if I'm not mistaken. It was just a, what was it? A 350 cubic inch engine? It's a 400 block. Oh, was it? 400? Was it, uh, did it call for premium fuel back in 71? No, I really don't know, man. I don't think it did. I don't think it did. Most Monte Carlos didn't. Only ones that called for premium fuel that I can remember were some of the Corvettes and things like that. But I would just put regular 87 octane non-ethanol fuel. And it's, it's, if you don't drive it, do you drive it a lot? Is it an everyday driver? Or is it one? No, okay. no. Well, put you in some CF5 or some sort of fuel stabilizer, whether, no matter, no matter what you put in there, put something in there to stabilize the fuel because after about six months, fuel really starts to go downhill fast. And I would recommend whether, I use a product called CF5 by BG, and I think it's a superior product over uh, Stabil. I've used Stabil before and pulled the tanks out after a few years. I looked at the tanks and pulled tanks out after using CF5. And the CF5 on metal tanks does a superior job of keeping rust from coming on a tank. It does a great job or keeps it down. If you got rust started, it keeps it kind of coats it, keeps it from getting worse. So Yeah, now this product he's talking about is I used to use uh, Lucas. Uh... Well, Lucas is probably a very good product too. It really is, but that's more of a, that's more of a fuel additive. Uh, to your gas, uh, it's not more, uh, the CF5 and, and the stuff I'm talking about, the uh, Stabil, they're designed for the tank itself, for what's actually holding the fuel. They're trying to make sure that fuel doesn't turn on the tank. 
is or turn bad you know when good fuel goes bad i guess but that's what they're trying to do uh, i lucas is more of a fuel conditioner to help it burn better inside the combustion chamber if i'm not mistaken i could be wrong i'm often wrong i really am so but yeah try something in there and do that but if you've got a 71 and it's running well you're doing a great job uh, on your diesels uh, you're changing your oil twice a year that's a great job about every I don't know how often you drive your diesels, but don't forget to drain the water separator. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your diesel Cummings has a water separator on it. Do you know where it's at? Mm, not really. Okay, I want you to go to that owner's manual. I want you to find out water separator because you're actually supposed to drain that once a month. Actually, I know you probably don't know it, but you're supposed mm -hmm. to go out there and turn that with your thumb and you'll get about a half a cup of fuel and water out, which is quite common down here. If you will do that, it'll save a lot of problems, but you're also supposed to change your fuel filter. I want to say every 10,000, oh golly, not 10,000 miles. Uh, how many hours? 300 hours. For every 300 hours, you're supposed to change your fuel filter. Now, does your car only have one fuel filter or does it have two? Your truck. Sure. I think it only has one, but I want you to go to that primary fuel filter. The primary fuel filter is where the water trap is, and you're going to. But go to your owner's manual. You say you got an 18, right? Mm -hmm. 2018. I don't have yeah. much information on 2018 on my computer at the moment because it's so new. But go to your owner's manual, open it up under maintenance, and look for water separator, and they'll tell you you're supposed to drain that. Actually, go outside and drain that. Uh, about once a month, uh, depending on where you live. If you live in a high humidity area, once a month is about right. If you live out west in Colorado, you might be able to go two or three months before you need to do that. But you need to be doing that to keep those filters from getting water in them. Because that's the biggest killer of diesel engines is water. If that water gets, on those, gets inside the injectors, it can destroy the injectors by what's called galling. The, the actual Diesel fuel has a lubricant in it, and it does a good job of keeping it from being galled. If that water displaces the fuel, it's no lubrication, and you can ruin your injectors. And they won't cover that under warranty, I found out. They, uh -uh, they, I, I've had customers come in with water on their injectors on their Cummins engines, and I direct them to the manufacturer, to the dealership. They go over there, call me back, and say, they're not going to cover it. I said, why is that? They said, because didn't, I didn't drain the water separator, and it's lack of maintenance. I went, uh-oh. You're on your own. So that's about the best advice I can give you on that diesel, Wayne. Drain that water separator. Okay. Okay. Find out where it's at. It's on the primary filter. It's, pro it's not that hard to get to. And, uh, and if you don't know where it's at, take it back to the dealership and ask them to show you where it's at. Okay? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm up against the clock. I got to go. But if you let, call me back the next couple of days and let me know what you found out, okay? Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your show. Well, thank you for calling, Wayne. I appreciate you listening and watching. Appreciate that. All right, everybody, we'll be right back. I got Karen Schoen calling all the way from Greenhead, Florida. Uh, not Greenhead, Greenwood, Florida. And she's going to be talking about what's going on up in Tallahassee or maybe what's going on in Washington with Brett Kavanaugh being nominated. I have no idea. We'll be right back. If you want the best deal in town for tires, you need to call Baytown Tires at 873-8900. Hanson and the guys at Baytown Tires take pride in serving Panama City for over 20 years. Baytown Tires on Highway 98 in St. Andrews. All service work backed by a nationwide warranty. Water is too powerful to fight alone. Mr. Rooter Plumbing, sink, shower, and toilet emergency drain services. All right, everybody, welcome back to our second half of our Wednesday morning show. We talked about diesel engines before, but now we're definitely going to switch gears and we're going to talk a little bit about, well, what's happening with Karen Schoen. She has a show every Tuesday night on blog radio, and they t uh, this last night was uh, Chris Wright. He was a special speaker, and they were talking about the Constitution and our, our what our founding fathers intended to follow, and unfortunately, we have a lot of people out there that think the Constitution is irrelevant and doesn't apply to today's standards. Good morning, Karen. How Good are we morning. Doing? Good morning. Good morning. How, now, tell me about Brett Kavanaugh. How did that interview go? I mean, not Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, Chris Wright. <laughs> Chris Wright was talking about Brett Kavanaugh last night. Tell me how right. it went. 
Well, I learned I learned something that I hadn't realized before, and it was quite a, a knock on the head. Mm. And uh, it seems as though we have, through our amendment process, granted illegals due process mm -hmm. in following the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So it works out that illegals wind up having more rights than Americans because of the wording of the Constitution, which, of course, you know, everybody takes uh, for granted. But this is in this Article 5 and in Article 14, where they talk about the rights going to all persons, mm -hmm. not Citizens. Not citizens. They're, they're rights it from God. It's all persons. I didn't realize that. It's that was an error on my part. It's from, it's, you know, God has given people, not, not American citizens, people, rights from God. These are certain, certain rights. And I know a lot of people kind of get upset about it going, you know, they don't have the same rights we have. Believe it or not, they actually do have those rights. And yeah, they do. The core rights are due process. Mm -hmm. That's what is being followed. And right. that's where Trump got into trouble. The problem that he's facing is that he is following the law as it is written. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, the people don't like that. <laughs> well, a lot, I think that's why a lot of people voted for Trump, because they don't like the way certain laws were being followed that were not constitutional. I think that I think that's one of the reasons because some of his campaign promises was you know to do certain things and and that's upset a lot of people. But I gotta admit he's been doing more in the last two years than most most people have done during their entire election. Uh, yes, he has, and the court and Brett Kavanaugh and judge justices like Brett Kavanaugh will make a huge impact to be able to keep America on the track of following the Constitution. And again, most people are afraid of that when they hear that, and you scratch your head and you wonder why. Yeah. And again, it's because they're not being taught the Constitution and their rights in school. So when they grow up, they have no idea what their rights are. Yeah. And as a result, they don't know, they don't realize, they don't follow the same type of, of, uh, of law because nobody's there coaching them. Whereas if you're an illegal, you have all of these attorneys, you know, falling all over you, making sure that you have your rights protected. Yeah, and, you know, that's a lot of people, like you said, don't understand their rights. I like one of the rights I have is a right to remain silent. I just don't have the ability. That's my, <laughs> <laughs> that's my biggest problem. And a lot of, you know, but yes, but those are just some of the, my, just to give you an idea, you know, due process, equal protection of the law. Our fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments are some of the most. Well, a lot of people don't realize what the fourth, fifth, and sixth are. They may know no, what the, they, don't. they know what the fourth is. They know the fourth is, you know, uh, making sure you're secure in your person's properties and papers against uh, illegal searches and seizures, which gets violated every day, especially with the asset forfeiture laws out there. But I'm not going to go there. And then you got the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment out there it has to do with due process and a jury and being judged by uh, uh, your peers. Those two out there. Yeah. And we just got, you know, you ask people that and they look at you like, I didn't know I had a right to be judged by my peers. I go, yes, you Exactly. Do. And that's a, that's a, you know, people have no idea. They have no idea. They will repeat that uh, their rights have been granted mm -hmm. by God, their creator. But if you ask them where do their rights come from, they're going to tell you the government. And that's right. Oh, and I... <laughs> Hey, you, here's the bad thing. I've asked teachers the very same question. Where do our rights come from as, well, first off, I said, where do our rights come from as citizens? And everyone says, well, from the government. And I'm looking at civics teachers who are telling me that. And I said, yep. well, doesn't our Constitution say that they come from our creator? And there's a silence on the end of it when I say that. And I go, well, that doesn't apply to today. And I say, oh. And I just shut up and I move on to another subject. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just so applies forever, and we better make sure because otherwise, people we are going to think that our rights come from the government, and we wind up in a situation like a man in Seattle who had his guns confiscated mm -hmm. for doing absolutely did absolutely nothing, but uh, a uh, another citizen 
in his community called the police and said he's staring at me. He, he stole? Well, because he was staring. Oh, staring. Uh, they came and confiscated his gun. Well, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Bless so, his heart. He's just not working. <laughs> the whole thing is, well, we really have to be careful when new laws are written. Well, when the way yeah. they're written and what they actually, actually say, not what we think they say. Well, that's, the thing is, that's, it's a, that's a violation of his Fourth Amendment if they came and took property with him without probable cause and without having a warrant, which I'm sure they got a warrant. I'm sure they did all those things right. But, you know, it's just a matter of you got people out there who need your, uh, they say, well, we, we got to get rid of the guns. I'm going, man, do you realize what happens when you get rid of the guns? The next thing you know, you get a knock on your door and you end up in a boxcar. Uh, you know? and, and that's why we are happy that President Trump elected somebody or, or nominated Nominate. someone who believes in following the Constitution as it is written, not adding things to it, not saying, well, in this condition we'll do this and in that condition we'll do that. Mm -hmm. No, this is the law. We all have to follow the law as it is written. The people know what their boundaries are. Otherwise, we have chaos, which is what we have right now, as people have no idea what their boundaries are. Well, people don't know their boundaries because they're not taught what their boundaries are. And I think this is, this is something that's been going on. I even saw it when I was in high school where they just seemed to want to get you through the school system and get you... Uh, you know where you get your diploma or whatever and it doesn't bother it wasn't so much about you getting an education it was more like how much money they got on the FTE or I think that federal tuition I don't know what it's called but they get money from the government if you're in school and I well yes that's that that is correct and what happens is the attendance that's why they hound you for attendance, attendance. all the time that's exactly that's right that, but that's how they get paid they get paid by the attendance and by uh, per, per individual, well, per, it, per student. It is amazing, you know, and I'm sitting here going, when I was in high school, I would I'd go in the front door and go right out the back door, and they really didn't say much about it to me, but one day they said, hey, you know, what are, what are your goals in life? I don't, they were getting money for me being there, and I, I have no idea, but I'm sure they were at that time back in the 70s, and mm -hmm. I said, my goal in life is to be able to have a, a, a skill. When I leave high school, I have can get a job. Well, James, you're too smart. You need to go to college and be a doctor or a lawyer. And I said, I want to be a mechanic. Is there anything wrong with being a mechanic? Well, mechanics, no. just, it's just not a real good job. And I said, why is it not a real good job? Well, it's hard work. I said, yes, it's hard work. And when you're 63 years old, I think that's the number they use, you may be tired of it. Well, I'm 63 years old. Yeah, I'm tired of working a little bit. But I'll be honest with you, I can't think of a better occupation and more satisfying occupation than using your hands and learning a skill like mine. And I didn't waste money going to college. I joined the Navy, got it, made my skill even better. I learned how to work on diesel engines and hydraulics. And that's what I think kids need. They need to have some sort of, well, we're talking we about boundaries. Go, yeah. They need to have a goal. They're not talk that, about that. <clears throat> they need to understand what goals are. They need to have achievements that they're going to, uh, work towards yeah. something immediate, something by the end of the year, something by the end of the you know, next couple of years, and they have to, they need to understand how to work within a time frame, yeah. how to work within a uh, structure, and you're absolutely right. They're not, you know, with, with what you just said, think about what you just said. I they yeah. said you should have been a doctor. Well, what did you do with cars? It's the same kind of concept. <laughs> I w instead I of working on people, you're working on automobiles. Well, that's right. So I grew up in a... That same brain power that you have to use. I grew up in a family that had doctors in it and lawyers and professionals. And I'm the only person in my family that didn't graduate with a college degree. And to this very day, I went to a family reunion and I was, um, my uncle proceeded to let everybody know that I didn't have a college degree. And I proceeded to let him know that I hire people who have college degrees. I and, don't believe, <laughs> I, I believe your sister didn't get a college degree. No, my sister, well, he, that, exactly. well that, that, the point I'm trying to say is a technical training out there. If you're listening and you've got a son that's got, you know, uh, you know, he's got A's or B's or C's or D's or well, I don't know what he's got. 90% of the time, if kids are having bad grades, it's because they're bored with school. 
because it's no challenge to them because it's just like it's just a lot of memorization and pass the test and you know make sure you follow the rules like the teacher says and they can't wait to get out of school that's why we have such a low graduation rate in this town in this county and i you know they'll argue with me about it oh we got a 75 percent graduation rate and i look at them and go how many kids did you start out four years ago in ninth grade well we started out with 900 in the school well how many kids are you graduating this year in 12th grade after four years 410. well if i do my math right 410 from 12 uh, from 900 and something is less than 50 percent yes so what am I wrong? Where's my math? Maybe I'm not using Common Core math. Maybe that's my problem. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely the problem. But it infuriates me when I see kids come to me out of high school and they have to fill out their job application and they print it out. And then I have, and I'm going, where, and then they have them sign their name and they print it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I look at them and go, do you not know how to write cursive? Nope. How old are you now? 18. You never got this taught person? Big, nope. This is a big, big problem. And one of the things that we can do, and maybe we can talk about next time, are one of the amendments uh, that's being offered to the people for the amendment in the Constitution in Florida would be to put term limits on the um, people who serve on the school boards. Well, I'll be honest you with you. That might help. Uh, I don't know. I, to me, I think term limits are at the ballot box. I've never been much for forced term limits because I know what ends up happening. You get some. You get some people when they're, they're doing a great job and they're forced to get out, and that, then that someone comes in that's that's ten times worse. That's the, or you have a planned agenda. So the next candidate up for that school board seat is backed by the people that are trying to make all the, the changes well, in the direction that don't need to be Like made. I said, the biggest thing, I really think if term limits were meant to be in, and our founding fathers would have put term limits in the Constitution for, they well, they didn't for president, that was finally put in in Roosevelt, but for Congress and legislators, state legislators, you know, they, I think the states have term limits, but not the federal. Exactly, yes. I and that's something that we should have also, but I can't imagine that they would vote that for themselves. No, they won't do that. They're not going to do that. But like I said, we're we're stuck with it because it would take a constitutional amendment of twenty two thirds of the states to do that. And it won't work. And we're out of town time, Karen. I cannot believe how fast this goes. Man, oh, wow, we, yes. Okay. We have a great time. Thanks for calling this morning, and I'll be talking to you again next week. And But I'd like to talk some more about, uh, we'll know more about Mr. Kavanaugh next week, will we not? Yes, we will. And he's really a good guy. The thing that everybody's afraid of and why the left is so afraid is that they just don't like the Constitution. They just want to be able to change it at will, and it doesn't work that way. And you're probably absolutely 100% correct. All right, we're up against the clock. Talk to you tomorrow, next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Part of what I'd like to let you know is what we do and how we work our system. Basically, we've got about 700 stocking dealers scattered around the 15 counties here in the Big Bend area of the state. I run a fleet of trucks, vans, and what we call a hotshot vehicles to deliver to our dealers quickly so they can help service you as fast and efficiently as they can. Provide timely and efficient service, and we're there to take care of our dealers who in turn can take care of their customers.